Good afternoon, everybody, and happy Friday. And welcome back to the channel. I have been off for a considerable amount of time, uh, and there's obviously been a lot that's been happening in the markets. Um, if you are a sell in May and go away type of person, then you've missed uh, quite a bit. You've missed, let me see if I can, the last time I updated, this is what you have missed on the top right side. So, uh, and that's just in the S&P 500, which has not been the outperformer. Uh, that has been the NASDAQ. Anyway, uh, we're going to jump in and uh, kind of ease back in and hopefully I'll be able to do some of these updates on a weekly basis again. Um, and I just want to take a moment to encourage you if you've not followed me on Twitter, you can find me on Twitter at Mr. J Thomason. You can subscribe to my free newsletter uh, at BeFinanciallyFree.Substack.com. Both the links for those are in the description of the video below. Uh, and so uh, what we'll do is we'll take a look at some of the major asset markets and kind of get a, uh, some bearings for what's going on and what to expect. Um, and then I'll look at some, uh, some, some other kinds of charts and some data uh, that I'd like to show you. Um, so on the screen, uh, I just want to just kind of start with this. Um, during the summer, um, I have been uh, hard at work. Um, obviously, I haven't been able to produce any videos, but I have been hard at work uh, continuing to refine and develop my indicators, uh, my analysis, and so on. Uh, and so what you're looking at on the screen with the colored bars, uh, or I'm sorry, the colored candles on the charts, uh, is an amalgamation of various technical signals, um, which uh, will mark the candle based on a composite scoring of those different technical signals. And so uh, when you see the green candle with the setup like this, uh, then it indicates uh, that the highest probability is long, um, and uh, at least on a daily basis, and then um, red obviously is the opposite, uh, that the uh, probability is to the downside. Um, and then yellow is uh, a kind of a neutral signal. And so uh, we'll look at a couple of the asset markets through this lens. This will help us kind of get our bearings. You can kind of see um, as you look back across the year. Uh, what I think is really nice is that uh, th this uh, composite signal um, helps catch some of these bounces, uh, bef uh, you know, some of these, like this bear market uh, rally that took place, as well as uh, a pretty significant portion of the bear market rally that took place in the summer of 2022 last year. Um, and then when you look back across uh, our bull market that we had back in uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, you can also see that it gives you uh, pretty good signals for um for getting out uh, before pullbacks. Um, and then uh, if you're a free subscriber, I'm sorry, a premium subscriber to my newsletter, then one of the things that I go over is, uh, and I share with my readers, is how I use these signals in conjunction with a top-down overlay um, in order to uh, figure out when it's safe to be long or short in the market, as well as where to dollar cost average into positions or out of positions uh, and so on. So uh, looking at the S&P 500, we have, uh, though we've been pulling back um, the last uh, two days, today and yesterday, um, we are still seeing a green signal. You can kind of see our, uh, our lower trend line. This is the, uh, this is the prevailing trend. Um, and uh, what I think is interesting is uh, if you clone this trend line, you kind of put it right, we'll say right about there, uh, you actually get uh, something that looks like a, it looks like a really good trend line, a really good uh, channel. And we actually popped above that channel and now we're retesting the channel breakout. And so on a technical basis, what this means is if you lose this trend line, then we're talking about a fake breakout uh, and fake breakouts are not, are, I mean, they're very bearish. Um, and so you would then probably see this kind of fall back down towards the lower end of the range. Um, and it's been since March that we tested the bottom of this range. And so um, I don't wanna use terms like overdue, but it seems that we are uh, potentially overdue for something like that. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to uh, point that out. Um, we're not that far away from our uh, old all-time high. Um, so if we just approximate this, we're currently about 5% underneath the all-time high. 
Um, so it's pretty amazing the rally uh, that we've that we've seen here, uh, all the way from the bottom. We got as far up as almost 30% up uh, from the bottom before this little uh, small pullback. Um, we'll take a look at the Nasdaq and the Nasdaq futures. You can kind of see uh, the signal changes uh, here. Uh, obviously, the Nasdaq has been the outperformer. Um, if you just go from the start of 2023, uh, we're up almost 50% just on the year. Um, and so this has run real hard. Um, and you can see uh, I I've actually been fiddling with this channel, uh, the upper end of this channel. I'm not really sure where the, the right spot is um, because nothing else really works. Um, this kind of helps uh, or this kind of worked out a little bit. You can kind of see uh, that price rejected uh, for the third time off of it. If you look at it from this angle, so uh, so um, you can see that the candle is red, um, so that's indicating uh, probability of pullback. Um, so just want to be, uh, just want to call that out. Um, the prevailing trend is still bullish, and I'll just say my top-down overlay is uh, saying that longs are safe, uh, longs are high probability. So usually, what that means is when these candles are red in that sort of uh, top-down regime, um, that once you get some of these red candles, then you want to start doing a, a DCA, especially on a, on a larger down day. Um, so uh, we'll see. Uh, this this could potentially fall another, uh, you know, 5% or so, and that would still keep it in positive trend. Um, that would be basically be a, almost a mean reversion of the, of the move that we've had uh, thus far. Um, and so I uh, just want to call that out as well. And when you go to the Russell, Russell had been lagging. Uh, but obviously, or basically since the day that uh, I last posted a video, um, it's been uh, on a tear, uh, kind of catching up. Um, we still have green signal here. Um, although what I do want to call out is if you, uh, if you could take a trend line right here uh, and do this, um, it kind of indicates that uh, we're getting a, a little bit of a rejection off this trend line. Um, and so we could potentially fall back down towards the middle of the of the. Uh, sideways triangle or potentially down towards the bottom. So I, I just want to call that one out as well. Um, if you're a, a shorting type of person, not that I would say that you should short here because again, my, my signals suggest longs are higher probability here. Um, and obviously the trend is your friend and this, at least the immediate trend over uh, since the beginning of June is up. Um, but if you're a shorting person, this is easy risk management. You just put your uh, essentially put your stop somewhere about 2010 on the Russell and uh, that's where you really that's where you know you're wrong that would put you basically at about the same high as the uh, February bounce or the top of the February bounce um, so that would be kind of the place to risk manage that uh, if we look at the dollar um, uh, basically since the the last time I posted the dollars down um, we finally broke through the 100 level, but uh, we've since recovered it back up. We've had a couple of pretty strong dollar days the last few days. Um, what I'm watching for here is to see if we get a, uh, oops, excuse me, if we get a, a, a rejection right here where price is actually currently sitting, um, this would be uh, the, the spot because you can actually see, um, this line is going to be really bad, but uh, you can kind of see if we draw this over, that's about, you know, that's going back over a year. Um, it's a pretty good trend line probably to, to base, uh, again, a short entry possibly off of. So um, the risk management here is maybe a little bit harder. Uh, you don't have as much uh, clarity as far as like a place to position a stop loss or something like that. So, um, oops, man, I cannot draw a trend line too, too out of practice doing this live. So maybe if you do a trend line like that, you could probably put a, a stop maybe there, but it's not very clear. So um, so I'm just going to wait and see here on the dollar, um, but I do want to call out. Uh, it was red, uh, and now its red candles are turning yellow, uh, and so I just want to call that out. That means that it's undecided right here at the, at the, uh, at the trend line resistance, so I uh, just want to call that out. Uh, we'll take a look at the 10-year treasure, treasury yield. Uh, big news from, uh, well, let's see how, how far back. Yeah, it's, I mean, since the last time I updated via video, uh, but... Uh, it was a pretty big deal because uh, this we got a trend line breakout. Let's see if we can position this a little bit better. Um, 
yeah, I'm not really sure here. Um, I had a different trend line. This is probably the closest that I had, but uh, but basically uh, what I'm highlighting here is that we uh, we got a trend or we got a breakout on the 10 year yield um, and we got up above 4% very shortly um, or very short lived, I should say, came back um, and then uh, have now the last two days had well, yesterday pretty much just had a a pretty strong up day. One thing I want to show you is I want to put the my tide indicator up and you can see we're still bullish tide. And so I want to call that out. That means that the trajectory is more likely to be up. You can see the green candles means uh, trajectory is likely to be up. So calling that out too. Um, gold, um, I have probably the, uh, I guess, most anti-consensus position, I would argue. Um, based on other things that I've seen this year. I mean, pretty much all of 2023 so far, it's been gold's going to make a new all-time high. And, gold, and you know, people were screaming for it all year, uh, all in 2023. Um, and my view, if you've been following me on Twitter is that, uh, and on my newsletter, is that gold's not going to have a new all-time high until 2024. Um, I think it's going to be on the far side of a, a credit cycle downturn. Um, and so... Um, I, I think that that's uh, important to call out. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you some positioning numbers um, that kind of uh, seem to me to suggest that my position isn't actually, uh, shouldn't actually be discounted. So I'll, I'll share that in a little bit. Um, crude oil, uh, after this really, really long uh, bear market that has, uh, oops, that has um, uh, kind of surprised people with its duration and has tricked people a whole number of times. Um, and if you followed me on my newsletter uh, or on Twitter, then this is no surprise to you. Um, but this is what's really interesting here is that um, price now since the end of June has been on the upswing, uh, positively trending. Um, and you're starting to see our tide line curling up. Uh, and what, what's gonna be interesting is if, if price can manage to stay up here, for long enough to get a bullish tide cross, that's going to be a pretty important moment and will be an opportunity uh, for like for a pretty secure long entry in crude. Um, I do want to call out just where the price of crude is currently located. Um, we've seen this uh, a, a couple of times, um, just highlighting a few here, 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 uh, and then this is the next opportunity. So this is the fourth time. Uh, in the last year, that price uh, has been um, has gotten above what what I call the control line, which is this gray line that I just usually keep it faded in the background. Um, but uh, uh, when when you're in a bearish tide, which is when the colorful line is below the gray line, um, then when price does poke up to the control line or above the control line, that is a prime shorting opportunity. I, and we've seen it all kinds of times. Um, so let, let me go back to the dollar for a minute um, using this. The same thing happened here and here and here. Um, so uh, where else can I find it? Um, if I go to the NASDAQ, right there, this it's happened here and here and here. Uh, and then it happens on the other side too, right on the, on the long side. So um, those are usually prime opportunities. And so uh, as far as oil goes, I'm not saying, I mean, Price can always, uh, I mean, at some point a trend is going to change, right? Like, so if you look back here, when price dipped down below here, then statistically you would say this is a good buying opportunity, but then price ended up going lower and then we got the cross. So that's that can always happen, um, but that's also why you have to size your positions correctly um, and that's why you have to DCA into positions um, so that way you don't put on full positions all at once and blow yourself up um, because you may have a, a bias or a conviction or something like that. So uh, Bitcoin, let's take a look at Bitcoin. Let me get rid of the, uh, the tide line. Uh, Bitcoin, interestingly, Bitcoin today, uh, before I started recording, this candle was still red. Uh, we're getting a yellow candle, which uh, suggests uncertainty uh, about direction. Obviously, Bitcoin is up slightly positively right now, um, but we have been going sideways since we got this boost up in uh, the second part of June. 
Um, again, that right here, you know, people started buying in and, um, how can I say people started buying and people were already talking about 35,000 and beyond. Um, but so far, uh, just sideways. And uh, I'm I'm undecided here on the direction. Um, I'll, let me uh, I'll talk about more of that. Right. Let me see here. Look at this. Um, so this is my uh, net liquidity gauge that I've uh, that I've used or I've been using. I made some modifications this summer where uh, basically the long story short of it is that I split U.S. liquidity and then global liquidity. So you'll see this kind of like cyan line. Uh, which is the lower line is the global liquidity indicator. Uh, and then the purple line is the U.S. liquidity indicator. Um, and basically what you see is U.S. liquidity has generally been sideways since March after the, the spike up after SVB, uh, kind of chopping around to the side where global liquidity has been trending down. And although we did get a pop uh, uh, in the early part of July, um, we are rolling back down. Uh, and so this is going to be uh, interesting to point out. So you can actually see Bitcoin appears to uh, have been kind of following along the uh, U.S. liquidity route. Um, and then obviously the S&P in the white line and the NASDAQ in the pink line have uh, definitely diverged from global liquidity. Now, you don't you can't just put the global liquidity line up there and say, oh, it's going to follow it exactly. Um, there are divergences all the time, right? So you can see all along here, global liquidity was different places and uh, asset markets went uh, went their way and all that. Um, it definitely, it, it does give you a sense of fair value, um, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that things have to go in a straight line right there um, or that the global liquidity, liquidity situation won't change. Um, so I just wanna call that out. But uh, what I was talking about with Bitcoin, uh, the biggest, uh, component that affects the price of Bitcoin is the liquidity cycle. And so if liquidity is heading down, both in the US and across the globe, then uh, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't bode well uh, for Bitcoin. So it doesn't surprise me to see Bitcoin uh, not so strong around here. Um, and so uh, obviously, you know, that's something to take uh, into account. Um, I want to take a look at a few things I'm going to pull up uh, my slideshow here, um, and I'll start with the the, the positioning uh, dynamics here. Uh, so one of the things I've been working on is uh, trying to develop some uh, some positioning charts. I'm trying to pull some data, and the the long story short of this is I've got uh, commodities, silver, gold, uh, oil, nat gas, the VIX, Bitcoin, SOFR uh, futures, uh, which is the kind of the Fed funds rate futures uh, indicator. Um, the U.S. 10-year Treasury, U.S. dollar, Russell, Nasdaq, S&P 500, uh, and what I've what I've basically started doing is um, I started trying to track the non-commercial net length as percent of open interest. Um, there are others uh, in the you know macro world that that utilize some of this data, and um, and I wanted to be able to utilize it myself as well. Um, so uh, what this is showing you is the blue bars. Uh, we've got the, I'm sorry, the black line down the middle is kind of the net zero length. So what you do is you take um, the non-commercial longs percentage uh, and subtract the net commercial shorts percentage for the net length. Um, and so the black line indicates a, a net length of zero. That means no more long or short um, or no, uh, no advantage to the long side or short side in any particular space. Um, and so the blue line, if it goes towards the left, uh, then or the blue uh, bar, I should say, um, is which is overlaid to the red and green bars. But if the blue line moves to the left, it means that investors are currently net short or the non-commercial net length is short. Um, and then if it's on the right side of the black line, then it means it's net long. And what's really interesting, or I'm sorry, and then the the uh, black, I'm sorry, the, the red bar, I'm just a little confused, I'm sorry. The red bar... Uh, indicates the trough, uh, and what I mean by that is uh, the net length percentage, the the lowest that it has ever been, uh, according to the time series. And then on the right side, the green bars is the peak uh, or the highest that the uh, net length percentage has ever been. And what's really interesting is when you look at this, some of these 
uh, assets, uh, asset classes are more narrow uh, in their net length. Um, and then some of them are more uh, broad. You, there's much more volatility in, in net length. Um, and you can see at the bottom, we're going down, some of these go down as low as about 60% on the trough and about as high as over 70% on the trough, uh, or I'm sorry, on the peak. So, uh, so then what you could look at is you know, a mistake that people will make is they'll say, you know, like here with silver, if you look, uh, if you follow my mouse where silver is, um, silver is net long. And a lot of people would say, oh, if investors are net long, uh, then that means that, you know, we're probably going to see downside, um, which one is, is not necessarily the most correct reading of non-commercial net length. It really depends on the asset class. Um, uh, but you can kind of see that there's much more on the green side than on the red side. So that means silver skews more to the right, uh, to the long side. That means that on average across the time series, investors are, the investors, at least in the futures markets, tend to be more long silver. Uh, and you can kind of see there, that same thing with gold, uh, with oil. Um, and then on the flip side, you see that there's much more net short. They're much more net short when it comes to the S&P 500 uh, or especially Bitcoin. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so, for example, some people would say, oh, investors are net short Bitcoin. Uh, that means that Bitcoin has to go up. And that's not necessarily the case, because if you look at it, actually, um, Bitcoin is currently above its midpoint as it relates to uh, non-commercial net length. So it's, so it's average. Um, and it's another way that you can look at that is uh, using the scatter plot here, where I've got on the uh, x-axis, so I've got the net length, uh, which is what you were seeing um, in the, the blue bars on this chart. Um, but then the y-axis is the percentile ranking. Um, and so across the whole time series, uh, what percent ranking is, uh, is its current position according to the CFTC data. And what's really interesting is uh, Bitcoin, while being relatively short, net short, you can, it's kind of buried behind right here, but Bitcoin's right here up in the top left quadrant. That means that uh, the percentile rank is above the 50th percentile, but it's still net short. So what's really interesting is that that tells you that even though investors are net short Bitcoin futures, um, that's not actually a very, uh, that's not a very bearish sentiment as, as interesting as that, as that is. That they're still on a percentile basis longer than they usually are as it relates to the futures markets. So then obviously on this chart, and, and I mentioned this about gold too, if you look at gold, it's over here. If you see my mouse towards the upper right hand part of this chart, um, gold is uh, over is over 60 percentile, uh, it's about 64th percentile ranking um, and it's net long. So again, it's not necessarily just about whether it's net long or net short, it's about the percentile ranking. And so all that is to say is that investors are not that short, or investors are, are, are more long gold in the futures markets than they are short. Um, and so I think that, uh, I, I think as far as positioning goes, then that tells me that, you know, a lot of people think that everybody hates the gold rally, and I don't think that that's true at all. Um, you also can see here that the US dollar, which is top right uh, dot here, the US dollar is very, very long uh, and it's very, very high percentile. Um, and on the flip side, you can see on the bottom left side that the 10 year treasury uh, is th that investors are extremely net short. If you actually, if I hover over this, it's in the second percentile. And so it's, there's, I mean, there's almost nobody left to short uh, treasuries. And so that gives me caution uh, because it's not to say that the 10 year can't get sold more and that the yield won't go up a little bit more, but it's not, it's not as likely. Uh, there's, it's, it's not as safe to go short uh, treasuries as it has been uh, more recently. Um, and then I wanted to show you this study that I did. Um, positioning can mean things, but then also sometimes it doesn't mean things. And on this chart, what you see is uh, the if you use the percentile ranking of non-commercial net length of the S&P 500 um, overlaid by the price chart, then what's really interesting is, uh, is that when you basically like in the middle of this chart, there's a, there's a change 
of what happens. So obviously this big dip in the middle is when the GFC was happening. After this point, what you see, what you tend to see is you tend to see the non-commercial net length percentage percentile ranking um, dip uh, kind of at some point after market dips. So when you see the, the black line uh, go down, you also tend to see a little bit of a dip in the uh, percentile ranking um, part of the chart, except for right here, which is, I, I think that that is what, 2013, uh, some around 2013 or so. Uh, but you see a dip in 2014, 2015, you see a dip in 2018, you see a dip in 2020, uh, and then you see the big dip in 2022. Um, and so, uh, what's really interesting is uh, the whole positioning issue. There's a lot of room for the S&P still to run, although it doesn't have to. And the reason why I say that is because if you actually look and you follow my mouse uh, right here in the bottom center area of the, of the chart, what you actually see is positioning as far as non-commercial net length was actually really small. Uh, you know, let's see here. Let's see if I can get this highlighted here. Um, let's see. I don't know why this isn't happening here. Sorry about that. I'm trying to do this. Uh, yeah, sorry. Anyway, the the point is, is in 2007, going into 2000, uh, into 2007, investors were positioned uh, like low, pretty short, like low percentile ranking. Uh, and we still saw price come down and that positioning didn't move up until after the the you know after september 2018 or i'm sorry 2008 um, after the lehman crash uh, and so all that is to say that you know you can't you can't just take one thing just like with liquidity or anything else you can't just take one thing uh, and try to put on a position based on just that one thing um, you have to take a, a whole bunch of different indicators, a whole bunch of different pieces of data and use it to an inf to inform a process or use it as part of a process to inform your uh, decision making. Because some of you may may look at this positioning chart and say, wow, like nobody is in the market on the S&P 500. So that means that uh, we got to go long right now. Um, but then you see in 2007 and then 2008 positioning was pretty low. And look what happened. We dropped, by the time the bear market of 2007, 2008, and into 2009 was over, uh, you know, the S&P had dropped something like 50%. So uh, so I, I, I think that you just have to be aware of that. Um, but anyway, it, it's really interesting. Um, so I think actually I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, so hopefully uh, you enjoyed this video. Uh, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Um, and again, I, I'm gonna attempt to uh, record these on a more regular basis. Um, hopefully they'll be shorter in the future. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.